Our scripture reading today is from the 14th chapter of John's Gospel, and Jesus says this, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will no longer leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Here ends our reading. Beloved of God, grace to you and peace from the one who created us, redeemed us, and moves among us still. Amen. So friends, during this 50-day Easter season, we have been reflecting on the ways that Jesus' resurrection draws us into closer relationship with him and also into closer relationship with one another. So if we at Grace have been talking about coming closer and closer, then why the heck is Jesus talking about leaving? This reading from John's Gospel is part of a longer section of the book that Bible scholars sometimes talk about as the farewell discourse. In chapter 13 of John's Gospel, the writer tells us about some of the most memorable pieces of Jesus last night with his friends before he is crucified. Jesus washes his disciples' feet in an act of love and service. He shares a meal with his friends that we have come to know as the Last Supper. He gives them a new commandment that's all about loving each other in the same way that he has loved them. Now, Jesus and his disciples are still in that same upper room where the Last Supper happened when chapter 14 begins. This is also chapter 14 is where this farewell discourse begins, which is basically four chapters worth of some really poignant and powerful moments between Jesus and his disciples. It's also like where Jesus is at his most wordy in the four Gospels. He's got a lot to say in these four chapters. He shares teachings and encouragement and prayers that are all about preparing the disciples for the massive changes that are coming for them as Jesus looks toward what he knows will be the final days of his earthly life. Now, if you have ever had the holy privilege of coming alongside a loved one near the end of their life, you know how tender and weighty and achingly beautiful that time can be. Jesus and his disciples are feeling all of that in the upper room, but the disciples are also struggling with a growing anxiety because unlike the path that we walk with loved ones, when a natural death is near, the disciples don't have the same kind of clarity about the path that's before them. It's becoming clearer and clearer that something life-altering is about to happen to all of them, but they still don't fully understand what's unfolding or why. Last week, Pastor Leland reflected with us on the first part of chapter 14 when Jesus tells the disciples that he's going away, that he's going to prepare a place for them so that they can follow, and where Jesus reassures the disciples that they already know the place to, to which Jesus is going But the disciples aren't so confident. Jesus, we have no idea where you're going. How can we possibly know the way, they ask him. And then again today, which of course is actually just a few minutes later in that same conversation that started here last week, we hear Jesus tell his friends that soon the world isn't going to see him anymore. They may not have a clear view of the path ahead, but the disciples have this growing awareness that Jesus is about to leave them, and it's freaking them out a little bit. They're confused. They're uncertain. They feel afraid. They're worried that they will be left abandoned. Orphaned is actually the heartbreaking word that John's gospel uses. Church, who among us 
has not felt exactly that same way at some time in our lives? Who among us has not felt confused and uncertain and afraid when the changes and chances of life seem to shake the very foundation of the world that we thought we were so firmly planted on? Who among us has not felt abandoned or orphaned at some time in our lives? Like there's nobody out there who truly knows us or sees us or understands us or is for us. Who among us has not grown impatient or frustrated or even straight up angry at Jesus when it feels like we're fending for ourselves in the face of all the vulnerabilities that this life offers up? Friends, the good news that Jesus speaks to all of us today is exactly the good news that he spoke to his disciples some 2,000 years ago. And it is good news, both simple and profound. And it sounds like this. We are not alone. You are not alone. Not even you, sweet baby Kyle. (laughs) In the midst of all that swirls in the hearts of the disciples in that upper room, Jesus tells them about another advocate who will come to be with them forever. Advocate is a beautiful name, I think, for the Holy Spirit, as are the names that some other translations of the Bible call her. Comforter, helper, counselor, friend, companion. This is the first time that we hear about the Holy Spirit in John's Gospel. She will play a powerful role in making a community, making a church out of the early followers of Jesus which we'll celebrate in a special way here at Grace in a couple of weeks on the church holiday called Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit continues to play a powerful role in the modern church as we learn how to be God's people, gathered and sent for the sake of a world in need in this new time. But all of these things are going to be revealed more clearly to Jesus' followers only as time unfolds. Because for now... All Jesus' disciples need to know, all we need to know, is that good news that is both simple and profound. We are not alone. You are not alone. The Holy Spirit has come to be with us forever, to walk with us, to encourage us, to look out for us, to care for us, to energize us, to stay with us. She is the embodiment of the divine love that we have come to know in Jesus, our first advocate. The same divine love that swept over the face of the deep, bringing forth beauty and light and every good thing. The same divine love that fill us, the dust of the earth, with the breath of life. The same divine love that came whooshing into a valley filled with dry bones, rattling them until they got stacked again, one on top of the other, ready to receive the wind of the Spirit from the four directions into their lungs so that they, too, might live anew. Still, today, right now, we are surrounded by the intimate presence of the Spirit of the living God. She moves against our cheeks, raises the little hairs on the back of our necks, rustles the leaves and carries the morning bird song to our ears, even at 3.30 in the morning, which wakes me up every night. I don't know what these birds are. If you know the 3.30 in the the morning birds, will you come talk to me after worship? Thanks be to God for the wind that carries their song into my bedroom window. (laughs) That Holy Spirit suffuses water and bread and wine with a holy and healing presence. She enters our ears and our mouths and our hearts so that we might hear and speak and serve with divine purpose. She fills the space between us, creating bonds of connection and hope between unexpected people. She's as close to us as our own breath, abiding with us from our first newborn cries until the final exhale that returns us to God. We are not alone. You are not alone. Friends, some of us came into this time of worship today heavy with grief. We are wading through the muck of fresh loss 
and can still barely fathom a life that no longer includes a beloved spouse or parent or sibling or friend. Or we are companioned by a heartache that is years or even decades old. And though we never would have wished for this grief, we sometimes find ourselves feeling grateful for it nonetheless, for the way that it keeps the memory of a loved one close. Or we're just coming to terms with a new diagnosis or a newly fractured relationship or a new set of fears related to a vulnerable person in our lives whom we love very, very much and are just trying to figure out how to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Church, if that is you, you are not alone. Some of us came into this time of worship filled with doubt. Our identities were maybe inextricable from the churches that raised us until we were hit smack in the face with the limits that those churches tried to place on God's wide and expansive love. Or we realized that we had never truly claimed our parents' faith as our own and are finding ourselves with questions that are unsettling at best, or sometimes finding ourselves even apathetic about the whole question of faith. Or we see so much harm done in the name of religion and wonder if any of it is even worth our energy. We are not alone. You are not alone. Some of us came into this time of worship at a threshold moment, those turning points in your life where you face a big decision or a life event that changes you forever. We're looking toward graduation, curious and hopeful about what comes next. Or we're wondering about a pretty significant career change. Or we're contemplating marriage. Or prayerfully considering ending a relationship. We're about to have a baby or to send our baby off to college or into military service or um, into a first job. We have a deep sense that God is calling us towards something more, towards something different, towards something bigger, towards something significant. But the shape of that call still feels pretty fuzzy around the edges. Friends, we are not alone. You are not alone. Some of us came into this time of worship filled with joy and a lightness of spirit that we maybe haven't felt for a very long time. Others of us are feeling deeply lonely. Some of us carry an abiding hope into worship today, this deep trust in God's creative and saving work within us and around us. Some of us are feeling weary to the bone. Whatever it is that you are carrying, Jesus' promise today remains as true as it did when he first uttered it to those first disciples. We are not alone. You are not alone. The spirit of the living God, our advocate, our comforter, our helper, our counselor, our friend, our companion, is as close to us as the air that we breathe. She is the presence and promise of Jesus, surrounding us in every moment, freeing us to live with more love and courage so that we might know and then also share the abundant life that Jesus came to show us, a life marked by health and healing and community and blessing and so much more, a life marked by the unwavering love of a God who promises to never leave us orphaned. We are not alone. You are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.